This morning we began a lesson that talked about living by every word of God and addressed more the concept or the question of what is the application of this within our lives? You know, what does it mean when Jesus said to Satan that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? And we began this morning in talking about that subject by showing that it is essentially summed up in following Jesus Christ. He is the bread of life. It is His message that we are to hear. He spoke what was the will of His Father. He is that living bread. He is the manna from heaven that if we partake of will give us everlasting life. He is the water that if we partake of, we will never thirst. And our lives as children of God, living by every word of God, begins and ends there, essentially, if you think about it. But it's all about us following Christ, but not just following Christ, but, but if you would, immersing our very lives within His teachings. Now, the thing about it, Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5 for just a moment. The reason why this is so crucial is because of the statement made here by John. Notice over with me in 1 John. And we're going to look there in chapter 5. And in the context here, let's back up to verse 20, verse 18 that is. We know that whoever is born of God does not sin. The English Standard Version renders it does not practice sinning, does not continue sinning. But he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. And we know that the Son of God has come, now note this, and has given us an understanding that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his son Jesus Christ. This is a true God and eternal life. So John here acknowledges many decades later, several, I guess, maybe decades later, depending on what you constitute as many, towards the end of the first century, he is saying that we know that the Son of God has come and has given us, Jesus has given us understanding that we may know him who is true. That's why it is so important that we live by every word of God and how we live by every word of God. We have to have this understanding. As we mentioned this morning, there are a lot of people who do profess a knowledge of the word of God. And whenever you sit down and study with them, they they talk many things about the Bible. But yet, when it comes down to the full acceptance of what it has to say, a willingness to truly follow Jesus in everything, they fall short. The understanding is not there. And that's the tragedy of it. Paul, when he prayed for the church in Ephesus, notice his prayer for them in Ephesians chapter 1. Let's turn over there. In Ephesians chapter 1, the specific verse is verse 18, but we're going to back up just a little bit here, not much. In Ephesians chapter 1, notice there, beginning there in verse 15, he says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. By the way, those in the adult Bible class, here's an example of a prayer. Okay, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now, we'll stop there. Paul's prayer for the saints there in Ephesus is that God would grant them the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him so their eyes, the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. 
so that they would know, so that they would comprehend. And this is what Bible study is all about, meditating upon the Word of the Lord, not reading it once a week. You'll never come to the proper understanding of the Word of God if the only time you do this is when you're here. Okay? If the only time we do this is when we're here, we're not going to grow as we are supposed to grow. It involves a daily study of the Word of God, a daily immersion, as we said well ago, into the words of life. Then and only then can we have the understanding that we need to have. And we have something that brethren in Ephesus did not have. We have a handy-dandy bound version of all the teachings now. They were still learning it. They were having to remember it. They were having to look at the things that may have already been written down by Paul and maybe some other things we don't have record of, but they had to hear much of it by oral teaching. That means by verbal teaching. Whereas you and I, we can quickly turn to and say, here it is. So we need to make certain, therefore, within our eyes that we, like the brethren in Ephesus, that we seek to have the eyes of our understanding enlightened so that we stay out of darkness and we walk in light. We made reference to that this morning in one of the passages that we talked about with Christ. He is the light. His teachings contain the light. The problem, though, is if we don't study and we don't live by every word of God, then we find our understanding becoming darkened. And Paul was worried about that. Matter of fact, he warned the brethren in Ephesus about those individuals who had allowed their understanding to become dark. And turn with me to the fourth chapter of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. And notice with me, if you would, in the text there, right around verse, let's well, start in verse 17, but the target verse is going to be verse 18. He says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of the mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all in cleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. See, that's the thing. When we choose to live by every word of God, we choose then not to engage in the things that the Gentiles had been guilty of. Instead, verse 22, we put off concerning our former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and we are renewed in the spirit of our minds, and we put on the new man which was created according to God. But if we don't study, if we don't live by every word of God, then our understanding, as we said, will become darkened. You know, it's interesting that in the context here, he's talking about the Gentiles. He's talking about those who reject the Word of God, those who refuse to hear the Word of God. But later in his writings and in the writings of Peter, he will, they will warn about those who will come from within. Paul, when he sat down with the Ephesian, with Ephesian elders, warned them that even from among yourselves, wolves would rise, would, would rise up, telling us that it's not just those who openly reject the Word of God that we have to worry about and that are a threat. He's talking about those within. Turn with me, and this, this isn't on the chart, turn with me over real quick to Hebrews 6 and kind of just bury this into the context, and here's the danger when our understanding becomes darkened. Hebrews 6, verse 4, for it is impossible for those, Hebrews 6, verse 4, for it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, here's what's impossible, to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. They walk away from the truth because they quit living by every word of God. And as a result, their understanding became darkened and they rejected Him. 
Paul's desire, Paul's prayer for the brethren was that they would have the necessary understanding. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 2, in a very similar fashion. Paul, in writing to the brethren in Colossae, <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2. Notice here, we're going to start in verse 1 of Colossians 2, but the, again, our target verse is going to be verse 2. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, Paul writes. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You see that? You see what's hidden within Jesus Christ? All the treasures of wisdom, all the treasures of knowledge. You want to go to heaven? The Bible tells you how to do it. You want to live a godly life? The secret's there. You know, and it's interesting. Oftentimes you'll hear about people who will, will, will philosophize. I'm not sure if that's the right word. They, philosophers will spend time philosophizing. How about that? And trying to figure out what the meaning of life is. And they try to try to come to some understanding of things outside of the Bible. Listen, you can have more knowledge than any of them. All you got to do is just study the Word of God and live by it. Then you'll understand. It's kind of like that aha moment that you talk about sometimes when finally everything that you hear clicks together. Then it begins, the understanding begins to grow. And it's aha. That's why he died. That's how I live faithful. That's how I live and why I live by every word of God. The thing is, if we listen to the world around us, and, and I know it's difficult. I tell you, when, when, I was, when I was a kid growing up, when I watched shows on PBS that talked about how old the earth is, old, and had all these depictions of the Big Bang and all that, everything. The best they could do was maybe some artist rendering, claymation of dinosaurs fighting each other, um, a cartoon illustration. But nowadays, it's harder on our young people. Because all you've got to do is find the right channel at the right time, and it's as if someone took a high-definition camera back to the beginning. It's amazing. It really is. To look at the level of graphics, and, and you want to applaud the people who are behind our, our, our level of what we can do now with visual effects. Until you begin to realize what's being peddled with that. Philosophers of men, they think they know. They think they have it all figured out. But God tells us, though, that they don't. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Yes, Dale, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I think, you know, I'm supposed to believe my brother. And so I told Dale, Colossians 1, 18 through 25. I believe Dale. Now, Dale, later I'll have you to believe me on something. So just file that away, you'll owe me one. No, I did, that's what he was referencing. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Notice beginning of verse 18. And keep in mind, while we may be astounded by what our thinkers think today and what they can do, the people back then were just as astounded with what they taught. I mean, because these, a lot of the, these, these uh, philosophers were paid. They were uh, orators, I guess is the word, where they would go and speak. <laughs> orators are someone who tried to say your potatoes, I guess. Orators who would try to get you to believe everything. Let's get back to reading, and I'll do a lot better. <laughs> Regarding their efforts, G Paul writes in verse 18 of 1 Corinthians 1, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? 
Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And that's the point that we have to understand. If we believe the Bible, then we believe God is greater than all. A lot of people claim to believe parts of the Bible, but yet they deny many aspects of it. You can't have both. If I'm going to say that I believe in God, then I have to believe all that the Bible contains. And if I want to believe all the Bible contains, then I reject the wisdom of man. And I embrace the wisdom of God. Even though man may look at me and say I'm foolish because I want to believe in God and, and, and all this other stuff, the reality is I'm embracing the wisdom of God. I'm embracing what His Word has to say. This is how and what it means to live by every word of God. You know, you'll hear people talk about Genesis. Some people suggest that the whole garden event there, the whole Garden of Eden, was all based on fables. But yet they believe in Abraham. And I'm trying to figure that out because if you throw out chapters 1 and 2, you need to throw out chapter 3 because it goes along with it. And if you throw out chapter 3, well, you got to throw out chapter 4 because if Adam and Eve weren't real people, neither was Cain and Seth, and Abel. And if you're going to throw out chapter 4, you've got to throw out chapter 5. And they do. There goes the flood. It's not around. It never happened. And then suddenly we're up to Abraham in chapter 12. Now the Bible begins to be real. Where's the evidence to support it? Accept it all or don't accept any of it. Faith says we walk by the wisdom of God. And the thing is, we can ask God for this wisdom. You know, again, go back to our prayer study this morning in our Bible class. Some of the things that we can pray for, James chapter 1, I've often been astounded by this statement here. Because we have the guarantee of our Heavenly Father that here is something we can ask for and believing, He will give it to us. If any of you lacks wisdom, James 1, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Now don't expect a miraculous wisdom slap upside your head. It comes from study. It comes from immersing your life in the Word of God. It comes by making application of it. And young people, you will find that today, you, uh, you look at your knowledge of God and you may say to yourself, hey, I'm doing pretty good. Forty years from now, you'll look back and say, you didn't know what you thought you knew. Today, you know a lot more. And then 40 years later, you'll look back and say, well, I didn't know as much as now I do. Because you've continued to study, to study, to study, to study. And this is how God grants wisdom. Or at least this is the most understandable way that we can comprehend that He gives this, this wisdom. But we have to want it. We have to ask for it. We have to pray to God about it. We have to put our trust in Him that if we will study and, and live and immerse our life within His Word, then the understanding will come. The knowledge will come. And there will always, I believe, you know, and think about my own life, I can honestly say there'll always be passages that will leave me scratching my head because I'm still not certain about it. And I guess at some point in the rest of my life frame, however long it is, I guess I need to find one argument on this one passage and say, okay, this is where I'm at on it right now. You know, there are a few things. Even Peter says there are a few things that Paul wrote that are a little bit difficult to understand. But it doesn't mean that we stop studying. We keep pressing on, building, building, and building. And there's a reason for that. Why is it so important that we have our young people in Bible classes? Why is it so important for us as parents to sit down at home and study with our kids? Why is it so important that 
our young people and our teenagers and our college kids and our young adults and our middle-aged adults and our little bit older than middle-aged adults. Why is it so important that we all continue to study and grow in wisdom? It keeps us from weakening. Remember the argument we made a while ago of Ephesians about they're talking about the Gentiles, how their understanding was darkened? The whole purpose for living by the Word of God, or not the whole purpose, but the benefit of living by the Word of God, it helps to protect us. Protect us. It helps to anchor us in a way that keeps us faithful to God. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And observe there with me in verse 20, and this is all we'll read of this context here. Paul writes to the church in Corinth here. He says, brethren, and here's his admonition to him. The context is of a different subject, but listen to the admonition. Do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. Peter makes a statement in 2 Peter chapter 3. His encouragement there for the pilgrims of the dispersion. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. He ends his letter here by writing, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Continue to study. Continue to meditate upon. Continue to apply so that we might grow and grow and become more mature with each passing year. That's what happens when we live by every word of God. One more passage to consider, if you would. Turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 4. Same thought of preparing ourselves, growing, becoming more mature. The target verse is verse 14, but I want to back up to verse 11. <clears throat> and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? Why equip the body of Christ and subsequently the local congregations, individual Christians, with these teaching elements, if you would, these teaching roles? He says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect, think about a, a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Look at that full growth there. Maturity abounds. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, he says. Then verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth and love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. And then he says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by whatever joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. So we see that all this has been given to us for the edifying of the body, so that the body itself may grow. But the only way the body grows is when the individual grows. We talk about this congregation. It will either stand or fall based on you. Think about it. If you are strong, then the congregation is strong. If I'm weak, then the congregation is just that much weaker. If you're mature in the Word, then the congregation is that much more mature. But if you're immature, or I'm immature in the word, then I have weakened the whole of the congregation. And so that's why God has given us all that he has, so that we might live by every word of God, so that we can all be mature, so that we can all grow. Now, it is true, and I heard a preacher say this years ago, he said, here is how you can tell that a congregation is growing. You have new converts or babes in Christ. Then you have those who have been Christians for a certain amount of time, and they're, you know, they're still growing. And then you have the very mature Christians who have been Christians for a long time. 
He said, that's how you can tell a growing and healthy congregation. But if you look out of, out of a congregation and every member is mature, where's the babes at? Where's the growth? Where's the new converts coming in? And so he's given us everything. So yes, there should be babes in Christ, but you are to grow. You should be middle-aged, if you would, and continue to grow. And you should be mature Christians and still seeking to grow. Not children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. I mean, there is so much more that we could talk about in this subject that, that we're not. But we could go into the direction of living by every word of God gives us hope. And it's a hope that keeps us faithful. It's a hope that is an anchor of the soul, keeping us on the right track. We can talk about the light that comes from the Word and shows us where to go. I mean, there's just so much that we could talk about in regards to living by every Word of God. But in the end, there's ultimately one goal. Whether you live by every Word of God the last 60 years of your life or the last week of your life, the end result is eternity in heaven. You know, there are certain things that we don't understand. We recognize that, but we will. For instance, John makes the point that what, Jesus, or what we will be like, we don't know. And what Jesus is currently like, we don't know. But we know we'll be like him. And a time will come, a time will come when we will have all understandings. I was meant to bring that songbook. Travis, what was that song we sang today? <laughs> Father Along. It's not in our books. Father Along will know all about it. Father Along will understand why. He says, cheer up, my brother. I forgot the rest of it, but. <laughs> cheer up, my brother. Because Father along will know. All knowledge that we need, all understanding, we'll have. Everything that helps us to, to, to finally comprehend what we've been going through, we'll have when we're in heaven with God. So think about that. If you are not a Christian, you need to put your life now into the path of living by every word of God. You can have the proper understanding. You can pray for wisdom and gain that wisdom. You can have eternity with God in heaven if you are convicted enough to turn away from your sin and to obey His command to be baptized so that you'll walk to, arise to walk in the newness of life. That you can have tonight if you're willing to live by every word of God. If you are a Christian, you've not been living faithfully. Question is why? The answer is you're not living by every word of God. So identify the problems. Identify the weaknesses. Identify the, the, the cracks in your life, if you would, and make the decision to repent and turn back tonight. Here's up to the Gospels called an invitation. Come forward now as we stand and as we sing.